children of God. So let's turn in our Bibles to Daniel chapter 11. We're picking up tonight in verse 36, and we will look at the rest of chapter 11 and conclude the book with chapter 12. It's Daniel eleven thirty-six 36 through 12, 13, title of our study this evening, Before Jesus Comes Again. Before we get into the text and the study that will follow, let me just say Daniel has been and is to this day under attack. There have always been those who will say, well, there's just no way we can accept the miracles. And the problem with that is if you don't believe in the miracles of the Old Testament, then well, do you believe in the miracles of the New Testament? And if you can't believe Jesus when he says the prophet Daniel or the prophet Jonah or, or anyone else, as Daniel you know, said regarding the, des- the you know, uh, abomination that causes desolation, such references mean Jesus actually believed Daniel took place and, and that the things in Daniel were prophetic. And, and of course, if they're not, then what in the world are we doing here studying this stuff? To deny that prophecy is possible, and that's the, the core problem for people who say, well, they just don't believe it because, because the idea in this, the chapters we looked at, the last couple, covered a few hundred years of history with a lot of detail, especially the, the last study. And, and so names are named and people and places and all those things, and they're saying, well, that's just not possible, so it had to be, have been written later. They'll later say the same things uh, about New Testament events and prophecies. But anyway, they say, no way, we say, way, Because we know these things were prophesied and they've all come to pass. Now, there's a transition tonight from those things that led up to Jesus' first coming to those that lead up to his second coming. And that's really where we're headed. If you know that the things of the uh, Old Testament related to his first coming all came to pass, literally, Well, then it's easy to believe all the things the Bible says about his second coming are going to happen as well. Well, so let's just jump in. Then the king. In Memphis, the king is always Elvis. But uh, this king is going to be Antichrist. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every God, shall speak blasphemies against the God, big G of God's small g. And he shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. That last statement is so important because it reminds us that even Antichrist, empowered by Satan himself, is under God's government and God determines how long it all goes on and then he says, okay, that's it. It's done, you're done, and well done if you uh, actually read ahead to where they end up. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses and a God which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Daniel 11, 36 through 45, lay out the last seven years of Daniel's 70th week, 70 weeks, excuse me. So Daniel 9, 24, you can go back and check it out or jot it down now. But we're looking at that last seven-year period when he mentioned the 77s that were determined for 
for Daniel's people and for his holy city, and we know his people, the nation of Israel, the holy city, Jerusalem, all these things will be completed at the end of the 70th week. We mentioned and focused last time on the life of a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, a uh, true legend in his own mind. Epiphanes means the glorious one. Those who knew him best called him the madman. And uh, if that makes more sense, of course, than that he was some glorious revelation from heaven. He is the forerunner of Antichrist, who's identified here, again, as simply the king. Now, we have a lot of other descriptions of him. We get some here. I'll share some from Jesus and some from Paul. Both of those seem to know a lot about the past, the present, and the future. But uh, anyway, Jesus does tell us in Matthew 24 that many would come claiming to be the Christ, the one, the, the Savior, the Messiah. But Antichrist will be the worst of the worst. And I say will be because many have come and some are around now, but he's yet to appear. I don't say yet to come because I totally believe he has to be alive somewhere on planet Earth today. And a lot of things are, will sort of set up for his appearance and the things he is going to be doing. We'll touch on some of that tonight. Now, just as far as a few contrasts, just a few between Antichrist and Jesus Christ, well, he poses as the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Antichrist is a liar and a fraud, while Jesus is the way the truth, and the life. And by the way, he goes on in that declaration to say, no one comes to the Father but by me. So whatever hope people have of heaven, because that's where the Father's hanging, there will be no access except at the great white throne, and that won't go well and won't last long. We'll touch on it at the very end of our study. Well, he's called the willful king, Jesus, the obedient son. He exalts himself, Antichrist, that is. Jesus glorifies the Father. Antichrist speaks blasphemy. Jesus only and always speaks the truth. Antichrist brings wrath. Jesus pours wrath out. Antichrist rejects the Father. Jesus lives to please the Father. Antichrist rejects the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Antichrist magnifies himself. Jesus Christ, again, magnifies the Father. Antichrist is about power and possessions. He honors and serves Satan. Jesus rebukes and judges Satan. Antichrist, we read in verse 37, has no regard for the God of his fathers. This could mean he's an atheist. It doesn't have to mean that. It can simply mean that, that he doesn't worship their God. It, it, if he's an atheist, he's an atheist who actually does believe in worship, primarily of himself. And so uh, in any case, he does demand that he be worshipped. And so uh, I don't know. Latter part of 37b, it says, nor the desire for women. He has no regard for the desire of women. Some have suggested this means Antichrist will be homosexual. I don't think that's what it's saying. I don't know what his orientation will be, but I do know this. The desire of women was a messianic title. And Jewish women prayed that they'd be the one to bear the Messiah. In fact, I'll give you a verse you can check out later. It's Haggai 2.7. I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord 
of hosts. Antichrist is called a beast in Revelation 13. He's empowered by the dragon, that's Satan, and men will worship both Antichrist and the dragon, the dragon and the beast, it says in Revelation 13. 2 Thessalonians 2, I'll give you just a few more. Paul calls him the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God or that's worshipped. So he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And that last phrase is probably not funny, but it strikes me that way. Because he sits in the rebuilt temple, which, by the way, means Israel has to find their way back to the land they have. And the temple has to be rebuilt. It will be, and I believe soon. But first, Antichrist has to come onto the scene because he's the one going to broker the deal, strike the, the, the deal to allow for the rebuilding of Israel's temple. We're going to talk a lot more about him in a minute, but, but, but here, here's the point, is that Antichrist, in order to sit in the temple and show himself he's God, see, I don't, I don't know, him sitting there doesn't necessarily impress anyone else, but he's very impressed with himself. And he shows himself, look at me, I'm God. And God's like saying, you're a fool, and the fool of fools, the greatest fool. Well, chapter 2, verse 8 in 2 Thessalonians called him the lawless one who will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume, get this, with his breath, the breath of his mouth, and destroy the brightness of his coming. Many will perish with him, and here's why, so important because they did not receive a love of the truth that they might be saved. No one's going to perish because God didn't love them. They're going to perish because they love the lie and embrace it with all they are and have. They love the darkness and they'll do anything to stay in it, to avoid the light. And so they don't find salvation because they love the darkness, and they love the lie. Well, verse 40, um, here in Daniel 11, says, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, with many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. Just a couple things. Earlier, Syria was in the north because we were looking uh, back in history, significantly back. And, and uh, you know, at Antiochus Epiphanes, he was the Syrian king. He's the one who came down fighting with Egypt. They went back and forth, always smacking Israel on the way north or south. And, and, but the circle here is bigger. Uh, Egypt is still involved, and, and Syria is still involved. But, but the, the circle has expanded, so now, now Russia is engaged. And I find it no coincidence that both Russia and Syria, not to mention Egypt, but those two specifically are in the news regularly. Russia just said, I think Putin made a declaration that, yeah, we're done here, you know, we took ISIS out, and uh, we're going home now. No one believes that. And uh, I don't think the soldiers are packing up. I don't think they're like, oh, Putin said we're going home. Because we know that, that they are going to use Syria as a base with which to attack Israel. Not only that, we know that, that and I mentioned this some months ago. I believe it. The more I think about it, the more it makes sense to me and just because I believe it and it makes sense doesn't make it true, but, but something worth chewing on that the people, the refugees, and, and you know it's just been one of the most horrendous ref, ref, refugee crises in our lifetime. Um, those people who've escaped, that's what's actually happened. They weren't just driven out. 
On the surface, they're driven out. But in the background, if you understand that Damascus is going to be destroyed and destroyed in such a way that, that no life will ever, you know, be able to, to be there until the millennium because everything gets better then. But uh, th the point is this. If it's true that, that everything we think is going to happen in Syria will happen, and there's no reason to think otherwise, those people who've been dispersed, they have a chance to live and give their lives to the Lord. And it's all about people reaching out to them. So if you run into any Syrians, share Jesus with them and just share what a miracle that you're here. Amazing. And they're like, you don't know all we went through to get here. That's not even the issue. Share the miracle that God brought them out so that they could hear that he exists and loves them. And as bad as things were back home, as bad as Assad and ISIS and everybody else bombing the heck out of those innocent people, in spite of all that, they're out. The ones who survived have a chance to give their lives to the Lord and thank God for rescuing them and bringing them out. Well, speaking of Antichrist, moving back to him, verse 41 says, he shall also enter the glorious land. You don't have to wonder, well, what could the glorious land be? Many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand. This is important. Make a mental note. The Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. So do a little research. Look at the Bible map in the back of your your Bible or one of those that shows those countries, especially back in uh, Jesus' day, because they're basically in the same place today. Some of them called something a little different, but they're still there. It says they're going to survive all this. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt, take note, shall not escape. So Syria is not going to make it. Egypt's not going to make it. So if you have Egyptian friends, you might give them a call and say, hey, you should come on over and hang here. It's not going to go well there. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. I wonder, all these commercials, buy the gold, buy the silver. I don't think it's going to work out in the end. Also, the Libyans and Ethiopians, you've heard of them. Gaddafi was Libyan. I don't know who's ruling there right now. If I did, I would say it. But by the time someone hears this on the radio three years from now or two years, it's a different guy anyway. But uh, enough to say these guys are going to align themselves with Egypt, which is not going to go well since Egypt is not going to survive the Antichrist. They shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and north shall trouble them. Therefore, he'll go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. The glorious holy mountain can only be in the glorious land. And that glorious holy mountain is that mount where Solomon first built his temple, where Jesus was crucified rose again, ascended into heaven, and where he will return, setting his feet down on the Mount of Olives, splitting that thing in two. Anyway, that's why that, that Israel and Jerusalem specifically is always a hotbed. It's why it's always in the news. It's why it's always contested. I couldn't believe people were upset when our president said, we're going to acknowledge that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Do you know it's been, I can't remember the exact date, but it's over 20 years, 22, 23 years since we already did that. 1995, thank you very much. I know she pays attention, not just to this stuff, but to the news. So, so here's the thing. All the president since of every, every six months or so, they sign this little thing saying, well, we still believe it. We're just not going to do anything about it. And, and like all of a sudden, someone comes and says, elect me and I'll, we'll move, the, you know, we'll move our, our operation to, to Jerusalem, acknowledging it as the capital of Israel. Listen, it was, is, and will always be. 
The whole world can turn against Israel, which the scripture says is going to happen. And Jerusalem is still the capital of Israel. And Jesus is going to rule and reign from there. And at this point, it's interesting, it says that, that Antichrist, he plants himself, he has his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. That's, that's like Gaza, I believe, today. And I don't know how that all plays out or fits in. But I do love the last part of verse 45. It says, yet he shall come to his end. That's a quaint way of saying he is going to be smashed by the Lord. And no one will help him. Antichrist, the worst of the worst of all who ruled over men. He appears, first of all, as a man of peace, posing as the prince of peace. Revelation 6, 1, listen. I saw that when the lamb opened one of the seals, the lamb is who? Jesus Christ. So you got to know that this rider on the, the white horse is not him because he's the one breaking the seal and sending this first um, one forward. He says, I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. The idea that Antichrist first comes in peace, well, he's riding a white horse and the good guys always do that, right? And they got the white hat and the white horse and but, but also a bow, but no arrows. A crown given to him. Jesus, well, he doesn't receive his crown. He has always been the king of kings and lord of lords. And this one goes out to conquer and conquering, conquering and to conquer. As I mentioned, he'll broker the deal for the rebuilding of Israel's temple in Jerusalem and the world will marvel at him and the world will follow him. A 10 nation confederation will unite behind him enabling him to rule and reign until Jesus says enough. It's Revelation 17, 12. Listen, the 10 horns which you saw are 10 kings who've received no kingdom as yet but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These aren't 10 kings who rule successively. That's the idea of some. It's not what the scripture's saying. They rule together. The one hour isn't literal, but it means it's a short time. It's the short season that Antichrist actually rules and reigns. And they rule with him. They are of one mind, that means none of them are in Congress. They will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them for he is Lord of lords and king of kings and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Listen, if you're with Jesus, chosen and faithful. We read it a week or two ago. You're with me or you're against me. You're, you're gathering or you're scattering. And so if, if you're with him, not just chosen and faithful, excuse me, called chosen and faithful. Well, Daniel 12, very familiar to Jesus, who quoted from it and alluded to it, as do many other New Testament writers. In verse 1, he deals with the promised tribulation. And it's important we're not confused about this issue because some seem to be. They're like, I thought he said I wouldn't go through the tribulation. In this world, you will have tribulation. He doesn't say you're not going to suffer at the hands of unbelievers. He did, and you will too. But the tribulation that he's pouring out the wrath that he's pouring out will not fall on his called and chosen people we're not appointed unto wrath we're told but to obtain deliverance and all that through our lord and our savior jesus man's wrath yes god's wrath never his discipline absolutely proof we're his proof he loves us if he doesn't discipline us 
we should be concerned because he disciplines everyone he loves. So if you're under discipline and not enjoying it, that's okay. The Bible says no discipline is enjoyable. So uh, you're just proving the scripture to be true. Verse 1 of chapter 12, we'll read it together. At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered everyone who is found written in the book. Now, in order to rightly understand all this, all we need to do is go to the one who absolutely understood it. And that's not going to be some writer or some pastor or some teacher. That's Jesus. So I want you to, if you'd like to, you don't have to go over. You could just listen if you prefer. Some of you are audio learners. Some of you read well and you learn better that way. Some of you just aren't good at learning, no matter what the style. But at least you're here. And, uh, and God can still get through. Hey, listen, Hope Academy was created for kids who struggle to learn, not because they're not smart or bright, but because they learn in different ways than some of us do. Now we have almost half the students aren't in that category at all. So, so it turns out they have their own problems, though. And yeah, I have a grandson who struggles to read. I have a grandson who's very much like me. And so that's all you need to know. Uh, they're the two. So chapter 24, Matthew's gospel, verse one, and this will be a preview of coming attractions because we will study all this in depth when we get to chapter 24. And we're in Matthew 13, you know, on the weekends right now. So anyway, I'm gonna read a good deal of this, not a lot of comment necessary. When it will be helpful, I will share. Otherwise, I'm gonna just read you Jesus' take on these things. Jesus went out. From the departing from the temple, his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat in the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Take note, three separate questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? His answer deals with all three of those and is so often the case. Some of the stuff is like, this is going to happen soon. This is going to happen later. This is going to happen even further. And we've seen this again and again. This actual study started in Daniel eleven thirty six with a, a revelation of the Antichrist. Verse 35, we were still looking at Antiochus Epiphanes. And, and, and there's hundreds, you know, hundred plus years between uh, Antiochus and Jesus and a couple thousand years between him and Antichrist. So all of that to say... That, as Jesus answers, he's going to weave some things. He's going to say some things that definitely apply directly to them. And then some things that are going to happen to their descendants as some of these things won't happen in their lifetime and not for a couple of centuries. Well, nearly a couple of centuries, and we don't know exactly how much longer. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age, Jesus answered and said, take heed that no one deceives you. So here's a sign they could have been looking for. We certainly recognize it today. Many will come in my name saying, I am. I am the Christ and will deceive many. He says, don't you be deceived because many will be deceived. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Anybody hearing any of that these days? See that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Many of you aware 
That beginning of sorrows can be translated birth pains or birth pangs. The idea being, and you talk to people, you read these things, share them with them. Famines, pestilence, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, that has always been happening, they'll say. But today, you can say, as we have been for since I've been a Christian and others before I became a Christian, yeah, but they're increasing in frequency and intensity. And this is a season where no one's going to disagree with that news. We all know there have always been fires in California. There have always been earthquakes in California. There have always been these kinds of things. But man, what's happening today, we just don't have anything to compare it with. And it's going worldwide, and it's going to only get worse. Famines, pestilence, those are simply incurable uh, diseases and such. It's actually scary to go online and just look at the things that they're saying about new bacteria or, or new viruses and, and how, you know, that all the antibiotics we have used over the years. And I don't mean you and me, but, you know, it's, it's not like, you know, that's something we would ordinarily abuse. But, but just the huge amount of it that's been distributed has kind of made a mess because there's, there's just something's going to always adapt, even something horrific, in order to survive. And, and that's what we see going on today. Famines, worldwide, pestilence, and by the way, at a time where we should be able to and really could feed the world if it wasn't for greed and, and war and every other um, thing that's just not our Lord. Pestilence, earthquakes, and they increase in frequency and they increase in intensity just as birth pangs do, saying you're there. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, we know he's talking to Israel. He's talking to his disciples and their people, his people. But um, this idea, hated by all nations and hated for his name's sake. Many will be offended, betray one another, hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him on the housetop not go down to get anything out of his house. Let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. So he's saying this prophecy of something Daniel spoke of. Well, you know, we saw it last time, Antiochus Epiphanes did something similar to what Antichrist will do. He, he put an idol in God's temple. He demanded that it be worshipped and that he be worshipped. Antichrist is going to do the very same thing. So again, there has to be a temple. Now, I don't know that he's going to put you know, an actual idol. I do believe his image is going to be there. And we live in interesting times and we start talking about an image because it no longer has to be on a painting or on something else. We just, well, as you read end times prophecies and you pay attention to technology, everything becomes even more radical as far as what's actually possible. Well, then there will be, verse 21, great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. That means we will be at a point as, um, as you know, the people of planet Earth where we're able 
to annihilate ourselves entirely. Everyone's kind of freaking out over North Korea. I don't think Iran is all that safe of a culture and a people. And, and, uh, and you know, the, the really, the tragic, truly tragic thing is that, that all of the Iranian people I've ever met were just nice people. But the Iranian leadership, not so much. And I, I'm certain that there are a lot of just, you know, caring, loving, and, and, you know, hurting people in North Korea and everywhere else where tyrants rule and reign. And so it, in any case, at this point, he just says, if, unless he shortened the days, no flesh survives. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. If anyone says, look, here's the Christ or there, don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. He's not saying it's possible. He's just saying if it were possible, even the elect could be deceived. So great will the deception be. And men, once they reject the truth, they'll believe in and believe just about anything. See, I've told you beforehand, therefore... If they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. What do they say? Hey, he came, but he's out in the desert. He'll be showing up soon. And then he says, look, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. Because when Jesus comes again, it's going to be like this. As the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming, the coming of the Son of Man being. I don't know if you've ever sat in a lightning storm, but you can shut your eyes and still see lightning through your eyelids, not just if they're thin like mine, but, uh, but the, the lightning is so bright. And, uh, and so he's just saying, he's not coming in secret. He's not gonna sneak into the desert and say, okay, get ready. Uh, he, when he comes, everyone's gonna know. Now, he is going to come for us, and we meet him in the air, his church. But when he returns, he returns with us. And when he does, everyone's going to see him, and we'll be there to see the whole thing go down. Then he just says, wherever the carcass is, the eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they'll see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I remember Raul Reese teaching on this passage and he said, Greg glory. But uh, I think that was, you know, he was just a big Greg fan, so... Uh, but it's great glory. He will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one heaven, end of heaven to the other. Now, at Jesus' return, Revelation 19, the beast, Antichrist, the false prophet, are cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. So Jesus returns to judge and to rule and to reign for a thousand years. Satan is bound, shut up, and sealed, and we're told where and why. He's cast into a bottomless pit. He's sealed so he could deceive the nations, shut up and sealed so he could deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. Well, Daniel 12, 2, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus promised a resurrection of the just and the unjust, of the believer and the unbeliever, of the sinner who's repented and the sinner who refuses to. Since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, there's just repentant sinners and unrepentant sinners. 
I saw thrones, Revelation 24, and they sat upon them and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who'd not worshiped the beast or his image, not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands. They'd lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. That's Revelation 24 through 5. Here's Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. If you're in Christ and Christ is in you, you will be a part of the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, for they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Daniel goes on to say in verse 3 here in chapter 12, then those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the word, seal up the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Daniel was a sealed book in Daniel's day. The two signs that he gives of the last days, though, when these things would become, you know, accessible and understandable and available, increased mobility and increased knowledge. The mobility part, it's obvious. It's all around us. The knowledge part, important. It's not just knowledge in general, although that is multiplying at a radical pace. The, the amount of, and, and I don't know if knowledge is the best word, information, there's a lot more of that than ever before. As far as knowledge and wisdom, those are often lacking. Why? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So here's what specifically this is relating to knowledge as it would relate to an understanding of God's prophetic scriptures, the plan and the promises, the prophecies of God's scriptures. Revelation 22 10 says, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. So while Daniel was sealed, Revelation was never sealed. And Revelation just unlocks all the mysteries along with Matthew 24 and, and, uh, and you know, some of the other passages, 2 uh, Thessalonians 2, some of the other passages we've considered tonight. Well, last few verses, and we'll come back and conclude with um, the only other group, um, but, you know, the, the unrepentant sinner, but, but first it, he says here, then I, Daniel, verse five, looked and there stood two others, one by the riverbank, one on the other riverbank, one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? The question is simple, how long? And listen, suffering saints have been asking the martyrs under the throne in Revelation. They're asking, how long do you avenge us on those who've taken our lives? They're still conscious. They're still alive. They lost their body, but they are with the Lord. Jesus' disciples all ask, how long? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river who, and he held up his right hand and left hand to heaven, swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. That would be a mystery to us if we didn't have all the other passages that speak of the very same thing. Time is a year, times is two years, half a time, half a year. So we're looking at three and a half years. That's the latter part of the last seven-year period, Daniel's 70th week, the time of Jacob's trouble, and, uh, well, the time of tribulation, and then, of course, great tribulation that we've been considering in the entire study. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, Daniel says, I did not understand, and, and I said, Lord, 
What will be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until, till what? The time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but, and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. The righteous and the wicked, the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, continually contrasting those two. There's no one righteous in and of himself or herself. Our righteousness is as filthy rags we read in the scripture. None righteous, no, not one. So our righteousness, if we have any, that's acceptable, imparted to us, imputed to us by our Lord and Savior who died Buried and risen again. From the time the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Jesus uses these very words. We read them. Matthew 24, verse 15. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, he just went on to say, if you're in Judea, flee. If you're on the housetop, don't even take anything out with you. Just go and get out fast for such tribulation, such as never been nor will ever be again is upon you. From that time, then he says, blessed is he who waits to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest, shall arise to your inheritance at the end of days. Last couple of things, and then Jacob will be up to lead us in some worship. Unrepentant sinners who died in unbelief do not rise in the first resurrection. They appear a thousand years later at the great white throne judgment. How do we know? Revelation 20, 11. I saw a great white throne, him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works. By the things written in the books, the sea gave up the dead in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. They were judged each according to his works. Death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. By the way, Satan, Antichrist, the false prophet, they have all found their eternal home at this point in that same place. This is a thousand years after the resurrection of the just. The millennial reign of Christ has taken place. Satan is released for a season. Don't ask why for now, but you can figure it out. And anyway, after all that, the day of their judgment comes. They stand before the Lord. The books are open and people get exactly what they say they want. I want to be judged by my works. Well, I don't. I want to be judged not based on what I've done or my good intentions or my best efforts, but I want to be judged based on my faith in Jesus and that alone because only faith in Jesus brings righteousness. Only faith in Jesus brings forgiveness. Only faith in Jesus brings life. To demand you're, you're judged by the things in the books, that's what's happening here. They open the books and men are judged according to their works. Verse 14, Revelation 20, death and Hades cast in the lake of fire, the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Here's the thing. Everyone gets to choose, but that choice happens in this life, not after and I share it week after week, not his will, any perish, but all come to repentance. And we read in Thessalonians that those who perish do so because they would not receive a love of the truth that they might be saved. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them, if you act upon them, if you live as if you believed them. Lord, thank you for this amazing, 
revelation in your word and from your hand. Lord, we know what's gone on and we understand the meaning of the cross and, and of all that transpired leading up to it and following after. We're so grateful you didn't just sacrifice yourself for us as an example of, of how to lay down your life for another. Lord, you died for our sins. You were buried and rose again. You did for us what we could never do. Not just atoned for our sins, but, but imparted righteousness as we put our faith and hope and trust and confidence in you. Lord, you've given us life, life everlasting, your gift, your desire, your heart, the very purpose for which you came, lived, suffered, died, buried, and risen again. And we've read, Lord, that the trumpet will sound and, and the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them there in the air. We will be with those who've gone before us. We'll be with you, Lord, forevermore. And it's not your will, any perish. It's certainly not our heart, any perish. So thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you have given us life and that you offer that life to any and all who hear your voice and respond to you. And if you're here and you've never said, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my every sin. Every born-again believer in Jesus has come that way. It's not about us and you. It's about you and the Lord. You were made by him and for him, and only one thing can separate you from him, and that's your own sin. So right now, right here, if you are ready to say, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my every sin. I want to stand with you in the first resurrection. I want to hear, well done, enter in. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. I don't want to be judged by my works or my efforts or my intentions, but by yours, Lord. You did what I could never do. You fully atoned for my sin. So I want to give you my life here and now. If that's you and you've never done it, I'd ask you to raise your hand and hold it high. And I'll pray for you and with you. And as, well, Jesus is the one who said it. Unless a man be born again, he'll never see the kingdom of heaven. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he said. No one comes to the Father but by me. Anyone this evening, anyone this hour, anyone this service. Lord, we look for hands, but you're searching hearts. And we know there could be those listening on the radio or logged on tonight that are in that place of brokenness, just desiring your forgiveness. And we pray they'd open their hearts and just say, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Forgive my every sin. You gave your life for me. Give my life to you. And I do it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.